Thank you for coming. Uh, I'm Randy Cushing, and I'm from New Hampshire, and I work as a state representative, and I also work with Murder Victims, Families, and Human Rights, which is an organization of uh, family members of murder victims who oppose the death penalty. And we're here tonight to have a conversation about murder and about the impact that it has on family members of murder victims and about the impact that the death penalty can have upon family members of murder victims. But we, the, the theme of this is to go is beyond the death penalty. Um, I think it goes without saying that this is a conversation that I think needs to be had about what do we do in the aftermath of murder. Because it's not simply enough to take a position in favor or opposed to capital punishment, from my perspective. That what's important to do is in the aftermath of murder to help uh, people deal with the trauma that rips apart the community, and rips apart a family, and to take steps to see that the kind of violence that we've experienced uh, doesn't get replicated. So this is built as, as a conversation, and I'm going to begin the conversation um, by sharing that I, you know, my father was shot to death in front of my mother in our family home 27 years ago. And in a somewhat hauntingly similar crime, my brother-in-law was murdered in front of um, in his uh, front step four years ago. So when I had a conversation about the death penalty, and when the rest of us in this panel have a conversation about death penalty, and we have a conversation about murder, it's not intellectual exercise, it's part of our lives. And that's important for uh, people who are part of this audience and the wider audience beyond to, to realize and, and to appreciate. Um, I'm gonna prompt a little bit of conversation, but I wanna have my colleagues here just simply go down the line and introduce themselves uh, quickly, and then I'm gonna start asking um, friends to share a little bit more of the other thoughts. How much do you want me to say? It's a conversation. We're being conversational. Okay. My name is Julia Rodriguez. Um, I live in New Hampshire, too. I'm from New York originally, and uh, my brother Greg was killed in the 9-11 attacks. I'm uh, Bob Curley. Uh, here tonight, uh, my 10-year-old son, Jeff, was kidnapped and murdered in 1997 on October 1st. My name is Fred Welch. I'm from Oklahoma City. And my only daughter, Julie Marie, was killed in the Oklahoma City bombing uh, 20 years ago on April the 19th, 1995. And, uh, after going through my first year of terrible grief and vengeance, I reached the point where I knew that I needed to change my life and speak of forgiveness and tolerance. And I spent the last 19 years traveling the world speaking against the death penalty in Asia, Europe, Africa, and all the states in the United States except two. Mm -hmm. One of the things that's um, important to understand is that uh, for every survivor of a murder victim, the worst murder is that of your own loved one the loved one has been taken. And one of the things about our society is that we, you know, we have some sanctions that are assigned you know, to different crimes. Um, and sometimes when one is, when one has the unspeakable happen, when one is the survivor, when, one turn, when it turns out that one has a family member murdered, there's nothing that prepares you for that. There's absolutely nothing that prepares you for that. You know, we're, we're, um, we're, we all hope that, or we expect, I guess, that we'll go, our loved ones will go, and we're about 108 
falling asleep in the middle of the night, or maybe we'll get cancer, or maybe we'll get, uh, you know, a tree will fall on us. But the thing about uh, homicide that's different than other kinds of death is that it's the conscious act of another human being, just like everyone in this room, who makes a decision to be the life taker, who makes a decision to do what we usually expect will be done by the forces beyond our understanding. And when you have the experience of having a family member taken by another human being, it really ends up kind of tossing up in the air, not just your assumptions about life and its order, but just about every fundamental assumption that you can have. And in a way, from the moment that you first experience your loved one being taken from you, you begin a process of trying to kind of reclaim control, kind of reorder everything, um, try to make sense of it. And to a certain extent, what we need in our, what we, what we need in order to make that kind of sense again is to understand what took place. And that's oftentimes, you know, we rely on things like the law enforcement personnel, we rely upon a court system to try to help understand how it is that our loved one came to be taken from us. And if nothing else, just for our own kind of understanding so that we can begin to have control over our lives. And I think for all of us, it's that, I know that um, it's that initial point when you find out that your family member has been taken from you that uh, kind of throws you into what I, I always talk about as, as the dead zone. Um, and I, you know, wanted to share a little bit about that. Before you get to who does, before you even get to how the loved one, you, or what, what should be done after your loved one has been taken from you, it's the experience of complete uh, disbelief. It's, uh, I don't know, there, it's sometimes it's difficult even now to talk about it because in many ways there's really no words that can accurately convey what the, uh, the pain is like, what it's like to have somebody murdered. Um, and on that, I would just like to maybe, for the conversation purposes, just ask my friends if they would want to talk a little bit about what that was like for them when they first had, when they first found out what it was, that someone was killed. If anybody feels like saying that. But touched on it. I think that for me, when I learned that Julie had been killed, one of the 168 people, the bombing happened on a Wednesday morning, and her body was not found until Saturday morning. Julie was Spanish translator for the Social Security Administration in the federal building. And that morning at nine o'clock, she had an appointment with a Mexican man that could not speak English. He had been brought to the social security office by a friend of his that was bilingual. Julie had left her office and went to the front of the building to the social security waiting room on the first floor to get her client. She and the two men were returning to her office and got about halfway through the building when the bomb went off and all three bodies were found together on Saturday. I had been told that had Julie had another two and a half or three seconds, they would have been deep enough into the back of the building that they would have survived because no one was killed in her immediate work area. And I remember how that just really, really taunted me as to why that happened why she didn't have that time. And you go through all of that, you know, all of those emotions, you blame God for it happening, or at least I did, for allowing it to happen. I uh, blame Julie because she had graduated from Marquette University 11 months before in Milwaukee. And the Dean of the Foreign Language Department wanted Julie to come back in the fall of the year to be a grad assistant. 
which they had never used in their Spanish department. And I wanted her to do that. She wanted to come home and work for a year or two before she went back to get her master's. And I was angry at her because my thought was, had she done what Dad had wanted her to do, she wouldn't have even been in Oklahoma City. She would have been in Milwaukee. And I was angry at myself at times because I had always encouraged her to learn a second or third or fourth language, which she did. She actually became fluent in five languages. And so I, my thought was there that had I not encouraged her to pursue foreign languages, she would certainly would have had the job of Spanish translator for the Social Security Administration. And you go through all of that uh, with the self-medicating with alcohol, and that was a dead end road. I did that for almost a year. And looking back on that terrible grief, and there's a lot of things that happened in, in, the, in that process, especially the first month after her death, that I really don't have memory of. Uh, sometimes I have some family member say this or that to me that I had said or that I had done. Well, I shut all of that out. And all of that becomes part of this healing process that you go through. And I remember the, the court system, their cure-all was that they were going to get the death penalty for both Terry Nichols and Tim McVeigh. And that was going to solve everything for me and the other 2,500 family members that were, in, that were involved. And I remember very clearly a Monday morning at 7 a.m., June the 11th, 2001, in Terre Haute, Indiana. We took Tim McVeigh from his cage and we killed him. And that was supposed to be the cure for me. What I learned from that was, indeed, I was re-victimized all over again. And that was what I had not really expected. I did not want him executed. I, I knew that. But I guess I truly didn't know why that I didn't want him executed until that cold morning in Terre Haute, Indiana. And I struggled for many months after that. And I guess my strong opposition to the death penalty is what it does and does not do for victims' family members. I guess my concern really isn't so much about the perpetrator. I mean, that's, that's kind of not what, what that's all about. It's what it does to us as human beings. And when you go through that, that whole process as I have, then you recognize that the best solution for me is to do what happened to Terry Nichols, and that's give him life without parole. He's in Florence, Colorado, he's never talked about. When someone is put on death row, it goes on for year after year after year of being re-victimized every time another appeal comes up. And that's, that's the thing that's so, so severe for victims' family members is that almost never-ending process. Tim McVeigh, in my view, would still be alive today had he not been a volunteer and asked for an execution date because he told his father, Bill McVeigh, who I had met, in uh, September of 1998 that he did not want to live the rest of his life in prison and that's why he wanted the execution. And I guess it's really hard for me to put it in words, the emotions that I've gone through over all these years, but I can assure you what happened to Terry Nichols is far better than what happened 
to Tim and Greg. Thanks, Bill. Love you want to talk to you, share some yeah. thoughts with us. As, uh, as I said, my name is uh, Robert Curley. On October 1st, 1997, my 10-year-old son Jeff was kidnapped and he was murdered. Uh, he was kidnapped from his, in front of his grandmother's uh, yard in the front of the house. He was watching our dog. And uh, he was kidnapped by two young guys who were 20, 21 years old. One of them had grown up in our neighborhood, Sal Sakari. The other fellow by the name of Charles James, I had never heard, never seen him. Um, Charles, James, Charles James was a member of a group called NAMLA. It's a North American Man Boy Love Association, a group that advocates sex between men and, and boys. And what they did with Jeffrey, uh, two weeks prior to October 1st, they stole his bicycle and they promised him they were going to get him a new bike. On that day, uh, as I said, he was in, in, in his grandmother's front yard. They drove by and they said, uh, Jeff, come with us, we're gonna go get you a bicycle. And uh, he ran in the house, he said, Nana, I gotta go, go with my friend, I gotta get something, I'll be back. He got in the car with them. Uh, they offered him a new bike if he had sex with them, and he refused. They offered him money if he had sex with them, and he refused. And uh, you know, Jeff was 10 years old, he, he knew right from wrong, and he, he knew enough to stand up for himself. Uh, they suffocated Jeffrey with the gasoline-soaked rag. They put him in a rubber made container and they dumped him in a river up in Maine. Um, it, took, it took the authorities 10 days before they were able to find Jeff and bring him home. In that period, uh, we went from one day, the first day of October 1st, as a missing, a missing child's case. Uh, we thought that Jeff was going to come home. We thought maybe he had stayed at a friend's house. Uh, uh, he might have been injured in the hospital somewhere, but he was going to be all right and he was going to come home. And um, one of the guys confessed to the crime. We were very fortunate that, uh, in the big picture, I, 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 I met with a lot of families throughout the country who lost children, uh, had children murdered, and you know, kids disappear, never find out what happens to them. Uh, you know, never being able to bring anybody to justice for it. So in that regard, we're, my family is one of the most fortunate groups that lose children in that manner. Um, until that time, I think I was like most people in my view of the death penalty. I know these are all, all you see have a strong anti-death penalty view, you probably wouldn't be here. But uh, I think mo most people were like me. I mean, which, whichever way the wind was blowing, I could have a, a view on the death penalty. You know, you hear a terrible case of what happened to Jeffrey and this bombing that took place here at the Marathon, and you say, yeah, there should be a death penalty. And then you hear a, a story of somebody who's wrongly convicted and uh, put on death row. And uh, that's pretty much the way I was as far as my view on the death penalty. Until that time, I mean, given what happened with Jeffrey, I, I honestly don't know how I could feel any other way than to be in favor of a death penalty. I mean, there's just so much, so much anger. Um, it's just, it's just incredible. But I can remember speaking to a group of reporters outside of, uh, in the front of the house, and I mentioned something about the death penalty. And when I did uh, the death penalty debate in the state of Massachusetts, was off and running. You know, it was. The cat was out of the bag, and, uh, and politicians were screaming to bring the death penalty back to Massachusetts. And, and what happened with Jeffrey, and I, I was at the forefront of, of bringing back capital punishment. Over a period of time, I think one of the first steps that made me take a little bit different view of the death penalty was, was were the actual trials of the guys that killed Jeff um, in the criminal justice system. Sal Sakari was just a tag along. He was not the real evil one out of the two. And he got a first degree murder, so he's gone away with, without the possibility of parole. And the bad, the bad one out of the two, Charles James, he had a very good defense lawyer. He uh, had a change of venue. And he got second degree murder with the possibility of parole. So when I, you know, when I look at that, I mean, and, and Sal Sakari actually did help the authorities find Jeffrey. You know, when I looked at that, it was like, well, oh, you know, this just a, it's just not right. But it took me, it took me a while before, you know, that just was just a little plea that was, a seed that was planted. 
Um, and I went for a long time thinking about it. As, as time moved along, I got to meet different people. Uh, I, I think the first two people that I met that had a family member murdered um, and were opposed to the death penalty was Bud and, and Rennie. I think we uh, drove out to do a television show with uh, Marjorie Egan and, and Jim Browdy out in, in uh, New England Cable News. And that was pretty much the first time I I mean, I, I can't say that I changed my opinion on the death penalty, but it certainly did make, make me think, think about it and think about it hard. And you, you have all these emotions going through, you know, geez, I mean, why am I having these feelings? Uh, if I'm opposed to the death penalty, is that in some way disrespectful to Jeffrey? And, you know, almost like, he, almost like I, because of what happened, I was obligated to be in favor of a death penalty, and I had these feelings that maybe the death penalty all wasn't, uh, you know, what, it, what it's cracked up to be. And, um, but that made me think, and as time moved along, I, I would run across guys that I had worked with and guys that I had grown up with that I would assume that were in favor of the death penalty, and I'd have discussions with them, and they'd give me their view on it. And, 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 and these guys were against the death penalty, and we, you know, we'd have uh, debates on it. I, I really didn't debate it much. I mean, I just listened to them. They tell me they were opposed to the death penalty and why they were opposed to the death penalty. But really, the defining moment for me in my change on the death penalty was uh, a fellow by the name of Manny Babbitt. Manny Babbitt grew up here on the South Shore in Massachusetts. Uh, he was in the Marine Corps, he was in the Battle of Khe Sanh. When he came back from Vietnam, he struggled. Um, he really, really struggled. His family here loved him, they tried to help him, but he wasn't doing good. So they sent Manny out to live with his brother Bill out in California, and he thought his brother Bill might be able to help him. When he was in California, he murdered two women. Uh, the authorities didn't know who committed this crime. But Manny's brother Bill knew that there was something going on, something just wasn't right with, with Manny. And uh, he thought he might be a danger to have him on the streets. And uh, he, turned, he turned his brother Manny into the authorities to get him off the streets, to, to get him the help that he needed. Well, the state of California, they went ahead and they executed Manny Babbitt. And the other part of that is a fellow by the name of Ted Kaczynski. You would all remember him as the Unabomber. It was the same. Same situation, the authorities had no idea who this guy was, but his brother David did. And his brother David turned him into the authorities. And uh, Ted Kaczynski was sentenced to uh, life in prison without parole. He was white, he was educated. Manny Babbitt was black, he was uneducated. Manny Babbitt was executed and, and uh, David Kaczynski wasn't. So that was pretty much the defining moment for me in my change of, my change of view on the death penalty. But it's just still, it took me a long time before I would publicly admit that to anybody. I mean, it was, you know, I felt terrible. I felt like a coward holding it inside of me. Why, you know, it, it was just awful. I mean, I'd have people come up to me on the streets, total strangers come up to me and had seen me on TV and they wanted to talk about the death penalty. And I mean, it was insane. People come up, they, they wanted to have the death penalty if you spit on the sidewalk, you know? I mean, it was just crazy, some of these people. So I just went through this period of just not saying anything, and I, I finally I got to the point where, you know, I just felt that it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair to me uh, being involved with what happened with Jeffrey, that I wasn't able to expe express my view on the death penalty and let people know how I really felt. And uh, finally one day I picked up the phone. I get a message from a woman, I don't remember her name, she worked at New England Cable News. She'd call me up every few months and ask if I wanted to talk and leave a message in her number. And this one day I decided to pick up the phone and call her and tell her that I changed my view on the death penalty. And when I did that, I often, I often think back to, uh, I don't know what you would call it, fate, or just the way, the way things come together sometimes, how strange things are, but I, did the interview with New England Cable News, I think that might have been on a Wednesday, and it came out on a, in the paper on the TV on Thursday and Friday, and it called, caused a little bit of ripple in Boston. And it just so happens, I got a call that day, all of a sudden it was from my, uh, my buddy, Bud Welch, 
telling me that there was a conference at Boston College, an anti-death penalty conference at Boston College, if I would like to come and speak at the conference. And I did. Uh, at that conference, I got to meet David Kaczynski. I got to meet uh, Bill Babbitt. And I got to meet a lot of other people in the anti-death penalty movement on that day. And on that day, it just happened to be Jeffrey's birthday, June 9th. So that's just, to me, and I still find it just strange the way things just work, the way fate goes. But uh, I'm here tonight. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm glad that Rennie asked me to come out. I'm glad to see Bud and a lot of other familiar faces here tonight and just express, express my view on the death penalty. I'm opposed to the death penalty. So. <laughs> I was trying to think where to start, um, and I think um, I'm a little bit at a loss for words, although that never lasts very long with me, but, um, you know, there's just so much pain, uh, and, you know, all the stories, everybody, I'm sure many people uh, in the room have their own um, tragedies that they've lived through. And it's really hard. It, it, these things are very hard to live with. Um, and so I guess that's my opening, is you know, hearing uh, the three other panelists tell their very personal experiences with um, a loved one being killed. And um, it's, it's hard, and I think that there are, it, it's also hard to find answers and maybe it's impossible, ultimately, to find the answers. You know, why did it happen? Um, why was she in that hallway? Uh, you know, why my kid? Um, my brother had actually just gotten back from vacation uh, the day before 9-11, you know, so I had similar thoughts, you know, why, why, why? And, and, and there aren't answers, and I think that, um, I'll come back to my personal experience in a minute, but I just want to say that the death penalty is seen as an answer. I think that's why we're talking about it, perhaps, is that a lot of people are under the impression that it'll bring closure, which there is no closure when somebody you love dies because love never dies. Um, and that person will always be alive with you until the day you die. So there can't be closure when something so horrible happens to them. Um, and the execution of a perpetrator, or in many cases, supposed perpetrator of that crime, it, it's not going to change your grieving, it, or it's not going to make your grieving better, rather. That's my opinion, at least. There may be people who disagree with that, and maybe they would feel some form of closure, and I can't speak for them, but I know for me that, um, the only thing I have to come to terms with is the fact that my brother is no longer living. Um, and in some ways, it doesn't matter how he died, although there is that added dimension of murder when you have to wrap your head around the fact that another human being did this to the person, and that is an added burden, psychological burden. Um, but I, I, nine years before my brother died, I was actually um, very suddenly widowed at the age of 24. So um, I have these two young men who I lost very young. My first husband, because um, I then remarried. Um, but my first husband was 29 when he died, and my brother was 31. And one died of natural causes. He was uh, ill, and um, the other one was murdered. And to be honest, at the end of the day, it's like the loss of a loved one. That's really what you're dealing with. And um, all the social dimension, the political dimension, the neighbors, and you know what people coming up to you on the street and whatnot, that can make your life easier or more difficult, but it doesn't change the fact that you're grappling with this. So um, I think the death penalty is seen by many as an easy answer, and I would say, in my opinion, it, it's, it's not, and it's also harmful. It, it's harmful to us, as Bud said, 
to be complicit in a conscious act of violence and death against another human being, no matter who they are. Um, and it's also harmful to the social fabric. Um, I'm a historian, I'm a history professor at the University of New Hampshire, and before my brother was killed, I had actually done a lot of research, just coincidentally, on the history of theories of crime and penal systems and, um, and the history of the death penalty. And, um, and it's very clear to me when you look at capital punishment in a broad time frame and also geographical context that it, it's really kind of a throwback. Very few countries that we compare ourselves to politically and culturally still have the death penalty. Um, and I guess what I'd encourage people who think it is going to help with closure or justice to just take a little time to reflect on it. Like both of these two men, it took some time. You know, it's. You, uh, Perhaps as a segue into my own personal experience, I'll just say, you know, at first you're just totally in shock. I mean, I literally had PTSD um, for like maybe a year after my brother was killed. It was so traumatic. Um, and, so, and, and then also the fact that thousands of other people died at the same exact time, that was horrible to contemplate. Um, so, you know, you're really in a daze and probably should be excused for anything you do for a while. Um, but, you know, interestingly, and this, you know, I'm a little different from Bud and Bob in the sense that this wasn't my child, and I really get that because um, after my brother was killed, dealing with my own grief and shock, at the same time, I was very aware that my parents were in a different place than me. And, um, you know, I don't know whether it's true or not, but I feel like I kind of had to be strong for them. And, um, and uh, you know, not quite as much succumb to the total insanity that takes over when something like this happens. Um, so I think even though I was in shock and certainly still can't believe it's true uh, that my brother is gone and, you know, will be forever 31 and never met two of my children and all that, um, I think I was able to keep a little bit of an abstract, like a theoretical distance from it compared to my parents and also my sister-in-law who had married my brother a year before. Um, so I never felt angry, actually, which people might find really hard to believe. I mean, certainly I've had flashes of like, you know, why us? But I, I really, after all the shock, or in between the shock, my main emotion was just complete uh, bereavement, just this person is gone. My brother, my only sibling actually um, is gone. He was killed and, and that's just sad. That's just, it, it's a loss like that. You, it, it's, it is difficult to put it into words and I'm struggling um, to do that. But um, I knew, you know, partly perhaps from being widowed nine years earlier that at the end of the day, the only thing that you have is to deal with the loss. And what happens to other people doesn't change the fact that your loved one is gone. Um, so uh, before the panel, one of the reporters asked me if 9-11 changed my views on the death penalty. And actually, another difference between Bob and Bud and I is that I was actually always against the death penalty. I, I'm not an activist, though. I, uh, this is my first time speaking in public about it, actually. Um, <laughs> it's a good time to be doing it. Yeah. Um, but I always felt it was wrong um, on every level. And 
uh, you know, for the reasons I gave before, plus other reasons. And when my brother died, I guess, in a way, you know, and then everything that happened after 9-11 with our um, invasions of Iraq and Afghanistan and all the additional deaths that occurred around the world, you know, supposedly in the wake of, of the 9-11 incidents, um, I, I think I got a feeling of how precious life is. That, that was something that's different after 9-11. I was against capital punishment in the abstract because it doesn't make sense. But now I feel like, you know, we, we being societies, governments, we really shouldn't be in the business of consciously, intentionally killing people. Um, you know, accidents happen, bad things happen, etc. But the death penalty is so, uh, it's a methodical, concerted effort to take somebody's life. And um, that just, uh, you know, as a philosophical issue seems um, wrong to me in light of how brief life is and how precious it is. Um, so I think I'll just end there. Okay. Thank you. I did want to get to you. Thank you very much. I did want to um, some, of the, some of my colleagues here chatted about it. I want to talk about what it's like to oppose the death penalty in a country in a, in a place where there's uh, the death penalty exists. Um, I talked earlier about nothing preparing you to, to be the survivor of a murder victim. Um, and you look around for figure, figuring out ways to get back to empty. Is, that's the way I always thought of it. You get so, so much is taken away from you. It's trying to figure out how to get back to empty. And what you do when you look for cues. And one of the things that um, we have in this country is that there's a widely held belief that all family members of murder victims want the death penalty. Um, they want that and they need it in order to find closure. But for some reason, we have to have the death penalty. We need to provide for the execution solution to victims' pain. And as a consequence, our public officials are oftentimes under a lot of pressure to enact laws that provide for the, for the killing of somebody. And so when you know that the most precious thing has been taken from you, your loved one, um, and you look around and what you're told is that you're supposed to want, you know, the way that we evaluate the value of a loved one is to see how society responds and that it meets out the, you know, the, the ultimate punishment. And in a way, I think Bob talked about it and, and, and Bud talked about it, in a way, there are all these pressures if you're a family member of murder victim uh, to support the death penalty. It's the default position is that, of course, you must want the death penalty for the person who is responsible for that. And I know a little bit from my experience, sometimes it's funny, if, if you are a family member of a murder victim and you oppose the death penalty, people sometimes will think you must be a psycho or a saint. You know? There's just got to be something a little off if you don't want to see the person killed. Or, you know, uh, maybe you, my favorite one, maybe you really didn't yeah, love your mom or your sibling or your saint. parent or your child. If you don't want to see the person put to death, you can't really, you know, couldn't affect you that much. Or, you yeah, know, then sometimes it'll be, uh, well, maybe the person somehow is culpable in their own, their own death. They probably, you know, maybe they were in the wrong place at the wrong time. And what's bad about that is that, uh, the reality is that those of us who've had somebody murdered and end up opposed to the death penalty, we're not, we're not psychos, we're not saints, we're just people who have the unspeakable happen to us. And kind of muddling through it, have come to conclude that a ritual killing by public employees isn't going to bring back anybody. It's going to fill another empty coffin. And if you think about that, um, that's not much of a legacy to our loved ones, if that's the most that you can offer. But one of the things that does happen, uh, I find that when you lose somebody and you share the grief, um, I, I know that I'm struck by both in Julia and Bud's situations where that was a case of grief writ large. 
I mean, it wasn't just that your family had, you know, Greg had been killed or that Julie had been killed, but there were hundreds of other, you know, 167 other families in Oklahoma City, thousands of families throughout the, the, the country who are also grieved, and in a way that transcends, in fact, all society grieves in a way that we, we, we don't try, try to do it. And that's a very, this whole grief process is, is, is pretty complicated. Um, and how everybody responds to grief is different. Family members all respond in different ways. And one of the things that I find it's, is, even though people respond to grief in different ways, it's a time when you're in a family of have something burdened that you really need each other because you share that common loss and you really need to help each other get through the empty. And what's interesting, not interesting, but sometimes what happens about the death that we all, uh, that we all kind of experience is that the death penalty, because it happens to be absolute, there's no kind of a half a death penalty or a partial death penalty. It's either death is different, everyone only calls death is different. And so sometimes in some families, on the issue of the death penalty, Unfortunately, it becomes a source not of it becomes a source of divisiveness, weirdly enough. You know, you can, everybody wants to see the person, everybody wants to know the truth, who killed somebody. They want the person held the child. The death penalty is a little different, it, it is a little different, and sometimes, uh, you know, we all know family members who get divided over the death penalty. You know, the child being killed, and, you know, parents will have different opinions on what to do. With the, with the perpetrator, with the killer. Um, and it's one of those little things that doesn't get talked about that really bothers me about the death penalty is because it ends up dividing families at a time when you really do need each other. And even, you know, obviously there's a, when you share, when you share this journey of love, it's something you don't, you know, somebody get murdered to know that you've shared the experience of closing a coffin on body of a loved one that was killed by another human being. That's, there's an unspoken sense of, there's an unspoken bond there that you don't need to get into the details with. Um, but oftentimes when it comes to the matter of the punishment, you, you, uh, you know, you don't really want to have a conversation. You don't want to break that bond of solidarity. You don't necessarily, if the death penalty comes up, if you impose the death penalty, um, I, I never tell another family member, a murder victim, how they should feel about the death penalty. If they want, if they want the death penalty, that's, I would never tell them wrong. I don't do that. I just, you know, I try to act in solidarity with them and I, I model what the, the behavior is. But sometimes um, the death penalty itself, it can become really, it's divisive. You almost don't, like, let's not talk about it. I go to meetings where you, you share the grief with other people and the death penalty doesn't come up because it's, you know, again, it's weird. I mean, I think for, the, for many people who haven't had the experience of a family member murdered, you think that the death penalty is the most important thing that has to be on the top of your mind instead of, the reality is that most people try to figure out how you're going to get up, uh, get out of bed in the morning, or you know what are you going to do with the empty chair at the kitchen table, or how are you going to get back in? Um, but we have this external fascination with kind of violence when we do killers uh, that sometimes just makes our lives. It makes it a new compound that's already a really difficult thing to go through. Um, and so, the, the, what's interesting, not interesting, but in the situation where you have multiple victims of one killer and one crime, then it gets even more complicated because how do you, you know, you have so much in common with people, and then there's this one little thing that comes up and you, you don't want to, to lose that sense of solidarity, if you will. Um, I will share because I know a lot of family members and murder victims, and I, I, I find sometimes that people, We'll get the will become one of those things that's it can be somewhat of a distraction and some family members uh, you know, I think some families some people get so fixated on on, on 
on their on the killer. They get so fixated on, on how their loved one died that they end up forgetting how their loved one lived. And that that sometimes helps. That's an experience that we have to struggle with so that that one act of murder, that one act of violence, which claims your loved one, doesn't also kind of claim your life or doesn't claim other people. It's a hard thing to do. Sometimes I think, I, you know, all of us, I know, I mean, we're not, we want to have the killers all accountable. It's, you know, we have a right to be protected. We have a duty to be protected. And I don't think there's any argument over that. We're fortunate that we have ways that we can do that with our criminal justice system. But that doesn't mean that we have, uh, doesn't mean that we kind of destroy, that we kind of go against our own humanity. And I'm going to I'll share one story myself about how when I started thinking about the death penalty the first time, um, because after my dad was murdered, I really couldn't give much thought about the killer. I don't know who did it, but, and I was just trying to figure that out. But when the um, when my father's killers were was arrested, uh, a couple days later I went to the corner grocery store and I ran into an old family friend, and he says to me. You know, I hope they fry the bastard. I hope they fry the bastard so you and your mother and your family can get some peace. And I looked at the guy and I was, you know, I, I didn't know what to say. Um, this guy numbered my life and I realized he was trying to give me some comfort. You know, that was, he was, that, was coming from, that was coming from a place of his concern for me. You know, that, I could get that far. But I didn't know what to say. And in part, I didn't know what to say is, um, I mean, he knew me my whole life. He knew before my father was murdered, like Julia, I, I was opposed to that family, not that I gave it much thought. But, uh, you know, I wanted to live in a world where there was peace and we respected human beings, but I wouldn't have everything to do with me. But at this moment, I, I realized that he presumed that because my father was murdered, that I changed my position on the death penalty. And I thought about that. And I realized, you know, if I did that, if I changed my position on the death penalty because my father was murdered, that would actually give over more power to the killer. That would me even know when my father would be taken from me. So too would my values. And I think it's kind of like that for society as it is for individuals. If we want killers, transcendent killers, and that evil, that bad stuff kind of triumphs. But the other thing that hit me is I came to this realization a few days later that, um, you know, that, oh my God, People are going to think I changed my position on the death penalty. And I was like, oh, jeez, this is another pain. This is, this is one more something I have to do because I had my father was murdered. Because people are going to presume that I changed my position on the death penalty because my dad was murdered, I'm almost going to be in a position where like, I have to affirmatively explain that no, actually, I don't want the death penalty because the default position is that you do. And it's kind of like, I don't know, that's why part of the reason I ended up sitting here talking in this public forum about the death penalty is that, yeah, we want you to know that some of us don't think that the death penalty is that good an idea and we're family members of murder victims. Um, anyway. We can continue. I'm, I'm, I'm almost ready to throw out another question for people. If you want, if you have any other comments, I do. I said this was going to be a conversation and I almost have conversations with the people who assembled here, but I wonder about if you know, you spoke a little bit about, um, maybe you can speak a little bit about the experience that you've had with dealing with people or Bob, or just what it's like to to try to do work that honors the loss of your loved one, that honors that, um, apart from, that has nothing to do with the death penalty, that has nothing to do with the murder, just things that, one of the things that we, I think is really important is to try to give meaning to the loss. Or just anything that you Oh, you. You can say anything you want. I. Yeah. Why don't you? Why don't one of you start? Yeah. And I want to go. You want to go ahead? No. Go ahead. 
looks like on the one. Um, yeah, I, I, I just want to say uh, I had I had somebody ask me. I, I had a discussion on a death penalty uh, a few months ago. And I had somebody ask me, well, you know, you're opposed to the death penalty. This was a pro-death penalty person. And he asked me, well, what, what would you say to, uh, you know, what would you say to the families that, that lost a loved one? And the only thing I could tell them, I, the best advice that I could give them is the best advice that I ever got. And that was, you know, it's bad enough that these people killed your loved one, they killed your son, they killed your daughter, or maimed you in some way. You had no control over what happened that day, um, but you have control over things now. It's bad enough that that happened, and don't let it, you know, don't let them take any more. Don't let them hurt you any more than they, they already have. And, you know, people often talk about closure. There, there's no such thing as closure. You know, you have to, um, you have to find ways to uh, move on with your life and, and, and manage things. So what, what I found, the most uh, dangerous and, and debilitating emotion is the anger. You know, you really have to, um, even to this day, I mean, Jeff was killed almost 18 years ago, and to this day, you know, you get this anger comes up, you know, it's like, why, why, did, these, why did these guys do that to Jeffrey? And I mean, it, you know, and it's something that comes up and it manifests itself in, in many different ways, and it's really something that you have to, uh, you know, you have to be, you know, you have to be alert when it does happen. Um, so that's, that's pretty much it. You know, you just have to move on with your life and, and try to honor your loved one the best way that you can by living your life in a, in a decent manner and, and trying to make the world a better place because of uh, what happened to your loved one. And that's, that's what I try to do. Well, I'm actually going to talk about my parents. <laughs> um, yeah. Because as I said before, I'm not really right. an activist. Um, although I do have yeah, strong opinions about those things. But things. Yeah. After, um, after my brother was killed on 9-11, my parents actually <clears throat> took some interesting public steps um, that, uh, you know, I guess some of them do focus on the perpetrators or supposed killers, um, but a lot of them really did go beyond that. Um, so uh, some of the things that they did was to go um, work with felons in the prison near their home in New York State. And um, my father still teaches uh, a class one semester a year. Uh, coincidentally, he's a criminologist. <laughs> um, you know, all the weird ironies. But uh, he teaches a class on sociology of religion in a prison. Um, and he also testified for the defense in the uh, Zacharias Musawi case. Uh, Musawi was the so-called 19th hijacker, the one who didn't get on the plane, so he wasn't killed on 9-11. Um, I think in terms of you know, the facts on the ground, he wasn't necessarily involved. I, my understanding is that he was actually sort of rejected by Al-Qaeda, but he was linked with them, so he was prosecuted and, and convicted, um, and it was a um, capital case. So, um, against his personal self-preservation instincts, my father, Testify for the defense, and I think he found it um, very uh, liberating after all the fear of the uh, feedback and, you know, just sort of being involved in the, the um, all the layers of human tragedy that that case brought up. Um, what else? That's that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Oh, and then. And, um, <laughs> Well, no, but sorry, one other thing that my mother has done over the years, which I found very interesting, and um, um, but did a similar type of thing, was to um, reach out to um, other, um, you know, people kind of on the other side, like the 
perpetrators themselves or the families of the perpetrators uh, to um, try to move beyond the, uh, the tragedy and to try to um, build better communication, more understanding, uh, actually kind of like um, Bob was saying, to build a better world, like it's bad enough what happened, let's try to put some positive out there in the world. Um, a film was actually just made about all these different things my parents did, it's called In Our Son's Name, and at one point my dad is talking about the prison work that he did, and teaching in the prison in particular, and he said something to the effect of, I'm really compelled to do this with these guys because I feel like I'm discharging a debt. And he had never said that to me personally. I saw it in the film, I was like, what does he mean by that? So I asked him, and he couldn't explain it. Um, but then we talked about it more, and what we came up with is exactly what I just said a minute ago. Something terrible has happened. There has been a rift in the universe. And so we do have that choice. Do we want to make that rift bigger? Or do we want to, in our own way, try to repair some of it? Um, and those are the choices my parents made. And I feel a little funny when kind of describing what they did, but, um, but I, you know, I think it's that, you know, uh, trying, to, uh, trying to repair the damage that's been done. Um, just in my own life, um, you know, I've basically tried to be more, um, basically just more thoughtful about everything and, uh, you know, watch for those reactions in myself that come up with an easy answer, uh, you know, like the quick flashes of anger and all that, but I have to say, I'm, I haven't put it into action quite the way that everybody else here has. I'm going to ask about the answer, but I want to talk a little bit about um, a hierarchy of victims that gets created, um, and also how people respond to victims in different ways. And there's a hierarchy of victims that gets created sometimes because uh, you know there's some of like good victims and bad victims. And some of it has to do with the context, and it's around the death penalty. And the context can be in amongst people who are supporters of capital punishment. Good victims are those who um, who want to see who support the death penalty. Um, and amongst those who oppose the death penalty, good victims are ones who oppose the death penalty. Um, and, and sometimes that can manifest itself, that, that this kind of a hierarchy of victims, uh, again, it's one of those things that I find challenging because in a, in a room where, for the most part, I, I see friendly faces um, because I oppose capital punishment, I never lose, fact, lose sight of the fact that um, in a room filled with people who oppose the death penalty, I and be in a room with one person who has had a family member and supports the death penalty, I have more in common with that person who's had somebody murdered um, who may support the death penalty than I do with most people who don't. And it gets a little uh, discomforting. We live in a really, oftentimes we, we're in a, the, our criminal justice system is really offender focused, you know, it focuses upon the person, you know, who is being charged with a crime. Um, we end up in a weird way, in a perversion way, what the death penalty ends up doing is making rock stars out of killers. Uh, people pay attention to what the bad people did. We have this morbid fascination with violence in our society. And in the process, because it's so offender focused, the, the victims, the experience of the victims, who they are, who our loved ones were, gets lost. Um, and at the same time, there's not, there's not much of a position, a role for victims to play in the anti, in, 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 in the, in the criminal justice system. Um, but we, I think those of us who, who try to, those of us who are involved in some of the anti-death penalty work are also involved in, in work that helps meet the needs of victims. 
And I just want to suggest to people here that it's as important it is and it's that we not kill people as a government. It's important that we help, you know, provide assistance to victims in the aftermath of violence, that we have a responsibility to do that. Um, and we should be involved in, in doing that. Uh, I find it in my role in New Hampshire as a public policy maker, it outrageous, I find it outrageous that I live in a state that's willing to spend millions of dollars to prosecute a single death penalty case. At the same time, there are 120 unsolved homicides that the state is reluctant to spend any money on pursuing, which when unsolved homicide cases exist, it means two things. It means one, that it means a number of things. One, it means that there's a killer out there who's still a threat to the larger community. It also means that for the victim's family member, there is a, you know, there is that lack of justice for their, for their loved ones. And I would hope that the death penalty abolition movement uh, and criminal justice reform movement are as supportive of trying to apprehend those um, and bring those who, who do bad and bring them and hold them accountable as they are to just opposing the execution of a few killers. Um, we also, I know that Massachusetts does a so-so job in providing uh, assistance for victims of crime and its victims compensation fund. And I would hope that uh, people would realize that there are uh, lots of unmet needs of victims of crime that don't get much attention and, and don't, get, uh, don't get addressed. Um, oftentimes in gatherings like this, it seems like the only time a murder, sometimes it seems, I won't say all that, but sometimes it seems to those of us who are survivors of homicide victims that the only time people really care about a murder is when somebody's being charged with a death penalty. It's just a regular murder, it doesn't really count. And I know now that there's a, I don't, I don't mean that in a way to be, you know, unsympathetic to my, my colleagues, but it, that's just the experience that some of us have it. You know, I have and, and continue to have. But you have something to say. I, I, yeah, I, do want, I, I want to say that this is a conversation I do want to have time for us to ask questions. I, uh, I'd be curious if uh, someone might have a question that uh, one of us might attempt to uh, address. Yes. Stand there, stand, stand there, please. I think we can hear you better. I just really want to thank you all. Um, I think there is, I've always been very close to that penalty, and I think there is a thought that people whose loved one is murdered, that they support the death penalty. I think that's a very pervasive. I think I have that thought, I think. Yeah. Um, I also really want to thank you for bringing up unsolved homicides. My son, my husband's best friend, was an Eritrean immigrant, a young man who was murdered on the streets of Boston. Poor, no family. It's an unsolved crime, and it's at the very bottom of the list for the Boston Police Department. Mm -hmm. And um, I was hoping Tina Cherry would be able to be here because she does a lot of anti-violence work in the black community here in Boston. Um, and so I was really glad that you brought that up. And I, I really just thank you all for speaking out and just being so like, honest and open because pain is pain is pain. And thank you. You, you said that this, that this uh, unsolved case was a, was a poor, a poor yeah, person. The fact that you brought out that this person is poor is one of the critical things in our criminal justice system. If this person was rich, this crime probably would have already, already been solved. And we see that repeatedly. And in this country, the states that have the death penalty, we never put wealthy people on death row. They have the money to be able to hire the defense attorneys if they need, 
And a case in point, just an example, is the O.J. Simpson case. We couldn't even get a conviction on him because he had millions of dollars to be able to, to spend. And the most important thing is poor versus rich. And color gets involved in that sum, but not near as much as wealth does. And, uh, and I think... I'm sorry? Thank you all for the I'm sorry, but I can't share the rest of your time. Tina was scheduled to be here. And yeah, just, and I think right, I'm worried about some of these two all here. Right? No, it's okay. We have some people who aren't able to make it this evening to part of the conversation. Um, There's another question over here. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. You? Go ahead. Here. Um, since we're in a faith-based setting, I thought it might be appropriate to ask, you know, I have a personal especially in light of all the um, what might have been your faith journey through this? Um, I didn't lose anyone violently, but my dad died in June. And I consider myself a very religious person, you know, and I think it not only helps you to examine your values and your emotions, but, but faith in God and spirituality or however you might define that. So I was just curious about that. Let me address it. I <clears throat> I think faith is important, and I'm a Roman Catholic, and I, I have people that would say to me, did your Catholicism help you get through? And I can't honestly answer that. And I've had people ask me, did your priest help you? And the truth of the matter is, my priest did not help me. And the reason he did not help me is because he's not trained to do that. We have some priests that are, but very, very few. Some ministers that are, but very, very few. So how much my faith helped me, I'm sure it did. I'm probably not giving it the credit that it deserves. Probably my, my education in Catholic elementary school by the Sisters of Mercy, I would say probably helped me more than, and of course that's part of my faith, and that probably helped me more than, than most, most anything else. I don't, I can be, myself, I can be in the imposition on the death penalty. Some people come from a very, you know, strong, and also you know, survive trauma from a variety of different ways. Some people strong faith-based tradition for others. No. I will make an observation that I think oftentimes the communities of faith um, don't have much of a capacity to deal with victims of crime. We do know that there are faith groups that have prison ministries. I don't know too many that have victim ministries. I, I think that's perhaps you know, in, in part comes from the, when I speak of that, I speak perhaps of the Judeo-Christian tradition, that that's part of the, you know, the, the consciousness of trying to, redeem, you know, looking to redeem the, the offender. But sometimes, as important as that is, I think the experience of victims gets forgotten quite often. And, you know, I'll just tell you famously, I, after my father was murdered, the local priest told my mother that he was in a better place. It was just not something that, resonated very well and um, didn't really play what that kind of thought doesn't really play wasn't very constructive in, among some people could I um, yeah. sorry to hear you're going through that um, like I said before it takes a lot of time and there are ultimately not as many answers as we'd like but the question of religion has been one that's actually always fascinated me, although I suppressed it until my first husband died when I was 24, and then um, a couple years after that, um, I concluded that I had to go to a house of worship. And I was raised um, by very 
both secular parents and in an interfaith setting because my mother is Jewish and my father was raised Catholic, but neither of them really practiced religion much when I was growing up. So it was kind of like an out of the box type of thing and, and um, my parents were kind of shocked at the time. And um, I started and I still very, uh, uh, you know, fervently attend a Unitarian Universalist um, church up in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which uh, has been really helpful for me. Although frustrating in the sense that, like, I keep on hoping that some servant or minister is going to answer all my questions about death, and I don't think that's going to happen. I've concluded. But what it does is it gives you the space and the permission to be bereft. And there is no other place in society that I can think of that gives us that permission. You go to therapy to help you cope. You do political stuff to make the world a better place. You have friends to make you feel better. But the only place where you can be sad and upset and um, distraught and it's okay is in the, you know, the, um, with religion. However, um, I think a lot of people do experience dissolution. Like my grandmother, for instance, who's fairly devout uh, as a Catholic. She was just furious, and she asked the priest, you know, what the heck? And he said, you know, Jesus called Greg. And I think it just permanently, like, disillusioned her um, on a lot of levels vis-a-vis -vis religion. Then on the other, other hand, my father, who had been non-practicing, um, did go back to church as well. Um, not Catholic, though. He decided to attend a liberal Methodist congregation because it's more in line with his, his um, whatever. And I think it has also provided him that space. I don't think it's given him as many answers as he wants, but it's been a comfort. So I think it's really individual, but on a personal level, I would say whatever helps you get through the day and your life, um, that's probably what you should be doing. Yeah. Question? Um, you mentioned a few things that uh, sound pretty terrible about people speaking to you about the um, loss of your loved ones. Can you give advice to folks like us on uh, maybe things to do or not to do for murder victims' families in terms of violence? I know some of my friends seem to shun and not want to talk to somebody, and I know that's not good. And some of it's about not knowing what to say or afraid of something terrible like someone mentioned. Well, I, I think that, I, I hope I heard the question correctly. I think that what people, you say that you didn't, don't know what to say. I don't think any of us do. And I, me being involved in, the, well, I spent 13 years on the board of directors of the Oklahoma City National Memorial, so I know many of the family members. And I would have family members that would come to me that I did not know. They would come to my Texaco gasoline station that I owned for 37 years. And they would say to me, uh, I saw you on television and my brother was killed or my mother or my daughter was killed in the bombing also. And the thing I always said to them was, I don't know how you feel. All I know is how I felt. And I would like to be able to reach out to you some way, but I don't really know how to do that at this point in time. And I think that's the thing that happens to, to us so many times. I actually had customers that I lost after Julie was killed. Julie worked at my gas station as a cashier during the summertime. And so quite a lot of my customers knew Julie. And as an example, I had this one girl that's about 25 or 26 years old. 
And she, I didn't see her for five months after Julie was killed. She came to my station one day and she said, I haven't been in because I did, didn't know what to say to you. And, but she said, I really understand how you feel now. She said, my, mo my grandmother died two months ago. Well, she didn't mean to be cruel. She didn't mean any, anything like that. But there again, she did not know what to say. Mm -hmm. Because when you, to me, there's a difference when my grandmother died and we buried her and when Julie died. Because you're, you know, I, I like to say when your parents die, you go to the hilltop and you bury them. When your children die, you bury them in your heart and it never goes away. It never, it never changes. Mm -hmm. So is there a ranking on death? I suppose that there is, uh, but it depends on, depends on the person, I suppose, as well. But no, I clearly understand yeah. about, what, about what you said. I just want to say thank you for the question. Most people love to do that. I, this Bud's time, I remember after my father was murdered, going to shop and saying, I'm just looking down the end of the aisle and somebody seeing me and doing a quick 180 with, with the shopping cart because I know they didn't want to pass me. And I realized it is difficult to try to think of anything to say. I think what's most, what really is important to say is just I'm sorry to be genuine and don't avoid people. I mean, I, part of it is if you feel like people don't want to get too close to you if you had somebody murdered because they were afraid it might catch. You know, there must be something wrong with that family. <laughs> that for Jesus, something, like, something bad with that family because they, uh, they had a murder in it. And it's just, that's not how it is. That's not, you shouldn't isolate people. Uh, but you also should be respectful. The other thing is to be respectful of grief. I mean, people think that, you know, grieving's a process. It's, it's, it's not an event. You can't say it's, oh, Jesus. And seven years since your daughter was murdered, why aren't you better now? Just be, be respectful and be genuine. Does that make sense? He's been trying to ask a yeah. question yeah. right here. Yeah. I want to thank you very much. I think it's a wonderful uh, evening to talk about the death penalty. Uh, I want to be a Vietnam veteran. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, problems that Walt brings and uh, <clears throat> I'm totally against the death penalty. And I've been protesting the war in Afghanistan for 14 years because I think it's just, it's a death penalty as well. Uh, but we have a trial down the street here at the Sinai trial, and that's a death penalty trial. And when that trial started, I, <clears throat> I said, I'm against the death penalty. I have to go down and protest it. When I walked down to the courthouse, I was the only one there. No one else showed up. Protests, which I thought was surprising because Massachusetts is so against the death penalty according to the polls. <clears throat> but uh, today, <clears throat> there were 22 of us at the death at this trial today, which is really amazing how we reached a large number of people protesting the death penalty, and it's still going on. The trial is still going on for the next couple of days. So I would invite anybody to come here to protest with us against the death penalty. This state. I want to thank you very much. Somebody else have another question? You, you had a question, huh? okay, It's more a comment, and I'm, I wonder if you all four are wondering why you are speaking out against the death penalty year after year after year. And maybe a part of that is that Julie is doing it. Well, in my, doing it. In, my, in my personal case, a piece of her is coming through you. Well, let would me tell you. Would she have been pro death penalty? No, I'm, I'm getting ready to tell you about her. <laughs> Julie was a, she was an activist against the death penalty when she was at Bishop McGinnis High School in Oklahoma City. She was also an activist against the death penalty when she was at Marquette University in Milwaukee. And after I went through almost a year of self-medicating with alcohol, it really dawned on me, that, and, and personally, I had always opposed the death penalty. 
my parents had, even my grandparents had. And after I finally came to my senses a little bit, I determined that really what I should be doing with my life is Julie had that little white flag that she carried. And she no longer can carry that. And I committed 19 years ago to carrying that little white flag for her. And I'm determined to do that until the day I die. I know that we have a, a few more minutes, a couple more minutes. I don't know if there's another question, so I just want to give everybody here a chance for any to share any final thoughts that they have. Um, we're still going to be around in informal conversations afterwards. This is you know, when we're, we're completed. I did at the outset, I want to make sure that um, Mass Civil Liberties Union also got a shout out for their support. I don't know, if, I can't remember if uh, Cynthia said that or not, because they, they've also been very helpful for this. And um, then New England, Northeast Office of AFSC. Um, but is there another question I want to I just, I just wanted to ask because I heard about this with Kevin Collins uh, yeah. following the globe yesterday. And I just wanted to know if anyone heard Sister Jane Prajean, if she got to testify. Right. Yeah. Uh, Sister Prajean is somebody. Yes, yeah, Sister Prajean. Pray Jean. Yes, I uh, spoke with her yesterday. She did. I know she spoke this morning. I think that uh, she's somebody who I, I think what I appreciate about her is that she actually she kind of gets both the offender part and also the victim's part, that it's important that when we have a conversation about violence that we pay attention to those who are harmed as well as those who do harm. Bob, uh, fun thoughts? Um, yeah, just, just to get back to the question you asked about what you should say to somebody who lost a loved one, just to just be sincere and, and I mean, you know, go what you feel if you're sincere and, and and, and just, you know, reach for the words that I think in a lot of cases people will understand. Um, we, we had a, a, a very eye-opening experience. We were, we were in Asia a few years ago, Bud and, and Rennie and some other folks. And just the way that uh, families who've lost a loved one through murder are, are treated there. We met a woman in Korea who had to leave her village that she lived in. She had her, one of her uh, family members were murdered and she was just shunned by the, uh, by the people that lived in her village. She didn't do anything wrong. Somebody in her family was, was murdered and she had to leave because, because of that. And uh, just the way victims are treated in different parts of the world, it's, it's, just, uh, it's just amazing. So just be sincere and, you know, not, not shun people and understand that <laughs> it's not their fault. Yeah. But, final thought? You have a final thought? Yeah, I want to. I want to say something about Governor Ryan in Illinois. Uh, I was at a conference at DePaul University. Sister Helen Brejean was there as well. Uh, I spoke. Sister Helen spoke, and Governor Ryan spoke. And what Governor Ryan did at that particular time, he only had like three three more months in office. And uh, there was a question about innocence in Illinois because at that particular time, there were 14 people that had once been on death row in Illinois that had, had been found to be, they had been exonerated. And what Governor Ryan said at that conference at DePaul University was, that he was going to investigate all 167 people who were on Illinois' death row before he left office. I went back to the back of the church where he walked to uh, after he spoke, and I had previously met Governor Ryan, and I walked up to him and I said, Governor, you don't have time to investigate <coughs> all 167 <coughs> people that are on death row. I said, what you really need to do is you need to commute the entire death row. 
because you've got too many people that are wrongly convicted that you will never discover. And I said, I'm going to tell you one thing that will happen to you the night that you do that. I know for sure you will sleep better that night. When he announced that the Illinois building, the state of, the state of Illinois office building in, in downtown Chicago, that he was commuting the entire death row, I was not present when he did that, of 167 people, he said to them, he said to the, at the news conference, he said, I know one thing, I will sleep better tonight. <laughs> and and I, I felt very, very pleased about that statement that he had repeated. And I said, he came to Oklahoma City about, oh, four months after that, after he was out of office at a conference we had there. In fact, we had, we had a, a meeting, a, a cocktail party at a, at a private home. And I said to the governor, I said, uh, Governor Ryan, why did you say that after you commuted to death row in Illinois? And he pointed at me and he said, you know exactly why I said that. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Julia? Think? Sure. I guess my final thought is um, that because life is short, <laughs> we should try to make it as good as we can. And um, to try to create as much, um, you know, uh, like I was talking about before, to repair the harm that is done, has been done and uh, is still being done. Um, I, I do feel that issues like the death penalty will be resolved democratically. Uh, it's a hard issue. It, there's a lot of disagreement. It's polarizing. Um, but, you know, we're lucky that we do live in a country where we can have an open discussion like this. And um, I think if we're all careful not to vilify the other side and to keep everything civil and thoughtful, then we will ultimately conclude that uh, capital punishment is not it, it's not representative of the society that we want to live in. I just want to say um, thank you for coming out to this conversation. I definitely you know, want to thank Amnesty and Mass Citizens Against the Death Penalty and New Hampshire Coalition Against the Death Penalty and Mass CLU um, for helping put this event on. I know that it takes place in the context of kind of against the backdrop of a, a high-profile murder case. Um, our intent was to remind folks that all murder cases are important, all murders are important, that it's much more than just about whether or not someone gets put to death or not, that we have a conversation about the death penalty in this country in 2015 because people are dying. That's why. It's all about homicide. And I would hope that we go out from here and, and know that in our communities that we can work hard to try to prevent crime and try to meet the needs of the victims of crime. And uh, knowing that hopefully we will come to live in a world where the death penalty is no more. And thank you.